Well, good morning, everybody. Thank you for joining us. You can open your Bibles to Titus chapter 1. Titus chapter 1. Well, as you know, we are still meeting in person, a uh, 10 person limit. We're doing three services uh, a day, or three services on, on a Sunday, and you can register for those online. And we're also providing these videos as well. Uh, and we kind of have a timeline for things changing. Uh, it looks like uh, middle of June, probably, we're going to enter stage one of uh, the Reopening Ontario uh, plan. And under that stage one, we will be able to do outdoor services um, with as many people as we can social distance. And so uh, six, uh, six feet between, or two meters between family groups, and we have plenty of property. And so we look forward to be able, being able to do something like this outdoors on our property in the near future, weather permitting. And so we will let you know as the time approaches. And so we look forward to seeing you that way. And uh, hopefully we'll be able to do uh, many people outdoors uh, singing and uh, preaching, uh, provided our families are social distanced. And so uh, we look forward to that change and uh, to the good weather and to being able to take advantage of the property that we have. And uh, we do pray that the government may revise these plans uh, to allow for a greater capacity in the church um, in the coming weeks. Uh, because the plan that they currently have is quite uh, quite slow and quite conservative and in what I in my estimation too conservative and so you can pray that way uh, that we can return to some sense of normalcy even faster the good news is the difference this time with this lockdown is that we actually have vaccinations this time and so as we are going through this very slow process we understand that something is actually being accomplished and that is uh, people are being vaccinated at a rate that will enable us to open up uh, and, and that's consistent with what we've seen in other countries, uh, like in the UK or in Israel, uh, who, because of their uh, high vaccination rates, have returned to a sense of normalcy. And so we look forward to that. Uh, in the meantime, as I've been saying, hang in there. Hang in there. We are almost through it. And uh, keep your spiritual cool. And keep your emotional cool and your mental cool. And uh, reach out to others. Fellowship. Connect with one another. Be encouraged. And uh, we're almost through the end of this. And it's going to be a wonderful spiritual success when you come through the other side of this thing and you're going to be able to say, I did it. I kept my faith in God. I, uh, I trusted Him. I maintained my cool. I, made, I lived uh, like a believer. I responded like a believer. And uh, you're not going to have to look back with any regrets. And so that time is coming very soon. And so hang in there. And we're going to encourage each other to that end. Well, in the meantime, we are going to continue with an online video. So Titus chapter 1. Titus chapter 1. As you know, we have finished a 16-part series on the qualifications of an elder. A 16-part series. And uh, that was in this passage in Titus chapter 1. And so Paul was very careful to give Titus both the mandate to appoint elders, as we've seen, and the means to determine who should be appointed as an elder. And so as we've mentioned multiple times, uh, at this point in time, Titus was left on the island of Crete to organize churches on the island. Many converts had been made on the island, but they had not yet been organized into local assemblies, nor had they appointed men as elders or pastors or overseers. Uh, Paul would not allow these believers to continue in this state for very long. It was a matter of urgency for him to see things set in order and for elders to be appointed. And so we learned something about God's design for the church. It's not enough uh, for Paul uh, to make converts. Uh, he wasn't content with that, just to left, left a fellowship with one another or to congregate together with one another. That's essential, but that's not enough. Uh, Paul understood that God's design for the church is that these believers be organized into local assemblies and that they have qualified leaders appointed to oversee them. And so, in uh, short order, Paul would have that uh, be done. And so, Paul, as a pastor himself, understood deeply uh, the church's need for spiritual leadership. Believers need overseers. Uh, the sheep need a shepherd. In fact, that's the very meaning of the word pastor. He's a shepherd. And so Paul emphasized this in his letter to the Ephesians in Ephesians chapter 4. He says that God gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, and teachers. And for what purpose? To equip the saints for the work of the ministry, for building up the body of Christ, until we all attain the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God. To mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness, in deceitful schemes. That is, churches need qualified shepherds and teachers in order to equip them for the work of the ministry and in order to uh, build up the church. 
the church needs elders to guide the church into loving unity and spiritual maturity and doctrinal stability. That's why God has given uh, shepherds, uh, pastors, teachers to the church. And so the implication there is that without such leadership, the church is susceptible to what? Internal discord, spiritual immaturity, doctrinal instability. Without loving guiding and the correcting and protecting uh, uh, role of the shepherd, what happens? Well, the church becomes susceptible. The church becomes susceptible to false teachers who would deceive them. A church without leadership is a church susceptible. And so Paul, again, would have Titus tend to this matter as soon as possible. Uh, this is urgent. This urgency, though, wasn't simply a matter of Paul kind of proactively, you know, preparing for the possibility that maybe false teachers would threaten uh, the believers on the island of Crete at some point in the future. That's not what's happening here. The fact is, the churches on the island of Crete uh, needed uh, elders because false teachers were already invading and infecting the church. And so remember where we left off in Titus chapter 1, verse 9. Remember, the qualified elder must hold firm to the trustworthy word as taught so that he may be able to give instruction in sound doctrine and also to rebuke those who contradict it. Well, today we come to the reason why this is so important, especially at this time on the island of Crete. Look in verse 10 and 16. For there are many who are insubordinate, empty talkers and deceivers, especially those of the circumcision party. They must be silenced since they are upsetting whole families by teaching for shameful gain what they ought not to teach. One of the Cretans, a prophet of their own, said, Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, lazy gluttons. This testimony is true. Therefore rebuke them sharply that they may be sound in the faith, not devoting themselves to Jewish myths and the commands of people who turn away from the truth. To the pure, all things are pure. But to the defiled and unbelieving, nothing is pure. But both their minds and their consciences are, are defiled. They profess to know God, but they deny him by their works. They are detestable, disobedient, unfit for any good work. And so the previous qualification was given uh, because what? There were real life challenges that needed to be addressed. False teachers were active and present on the island of Crete. It says that they were deceiving many and they're upsetting entire households. This needed to be dealt with. And so Paul would have Titus to get busy. It was to be dealt with, how? By qualified elders who would be appointed by Titus uh, throughout the island. Now, notice the severity of the problem here. In verse 10 of our passage, it says what? For there are many who are, and then he gives the description. That is, there's, there's a bunch of false teachers on the island. And uh, the churches were already susceptible, already being invaded and infected by this. Uh, households were already being upset. And so Paul sees the urgency. These believers need elders. They need leaders. There needs to be organization here. Uh, they need shepherds. Uh, and so he would have Titus be quick about this. And so uh, there are false teachers. Now we're going to learn something about these false teachers in this passage. And that's going to be the entirety of, of this lesson. Uh, we're going to learn about the character of these teachers, uh, the content of their teaching, and the consequences of their teaching. And then we're going to look at what, uh, uh, how uh, Titus and the elders he would appoint are to respond to this teaching. And then in conclusion, we're going to look at a contrast between these teachers and the qualified elders. And so first of all, let's consider the character of these teachers. Now, uh, we have false teachers today, don't we? And we're going to see some parallels between the characterizations here in this text and with false teachers that we are exposed to today. But look in verse 9 and 10 of our passage. It says uh, that, uh, yes, the qualified elder must hold firm to the trustworthy word as taught so that he may be able to give instruction in sound doctrine and also rebuke those who contradict it. For... There are many who are insubordinate, insubordinate. And that's what we're going to focus in on right now. That is, these men are rebellious. They are rebellious. That's what insubordinate means. Independent, uh, disobedient. That is, these men are unwilling to submit to authority. This, like every other characteristic of the false teacher, is in direct contrast to the qualified uh, elder, the faithful elder that we've studied weeks prior. For instance, remember uh, last week, what? The faithful elder must hold firm to the trustworthy word as taught. That is, he doesn't invent or innovate, but he simply 
uh, gives himself to understanding and teaching and applying the apostles' doctrine. Not his own doctrine, not his own message. He doesn't launch out uh, on his own to become uh, his own uh, guru or his own teacher. Instead, he submits himself. Uh, he subordinates himself, uh, puts himself under the apostles' teaching, submits to it, and teaches it. He's not a rebel. This is an exercise of submission. Uh, well, the elders, or I'm sorry, the false teachers on the island of Crete were not like this at all. They were insubordinate. Now, Paul told Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 4, he likened being a pastor to that of being a soldier whose aim it was to please his commander. Uh, look at that. Uh, no soldier gets entangled in civilian pursuits since his aim is to please the one who enlisted him. And with that, Paul uh, gives us this understanding of eldership as being under authority. An elder is a man who is under restraint. Uh, he is submissive, recognizes that he is under a commander, and uh, he must obey. Well, that was not the false teachers on the island of Crete. Uh, these teachers were the opposite. They're insubordinate and rebellious. They would not hold to the confines of Scripture, but instead teach as they pleased. They would not listen to correction. They would not listen to instruction, but instead they would just teach others uh, whatever they wanted. And frankly, they would live however they wanted. In the rebellion, they set a terrible example for believers. A rebellious or insubordinate character is not fit for the follower of the Lord Jesus Christ. A follower of the Lord Jesus Christ is just that, a follower of the Lord. Uh, he is authority, and they are submissive to him. He has commands, and they obey those commands. Uh, he gives us his word, and we submit to his word and receive it with meekness. We are under authority. That's the nature of a Christian, under authority. Not free to think and behave however we please, but we're under authority. And so we're under the authority of God, we're under the authority of Scripture, and we're actually also under the authority of the church. Uh, spiritual leadership within the church and accountable to one another. And so a good teacher should be open to correction and instruction and rebuke and accountability. Uh, believers uh, who are genuinely following Christ... Uh, with Christ-like character, should be open to correction and instruction and rebuke and accountability. That was not these men. These false teachers were rebellious. Next of all, not only were they rebellious, but they were useless. They were useless. Look in verse 10. There are many who are insubordinate, empty talkers, it says. Empty talkers. What does that mean? Vanity, vain. Their teaching was useless. Their teaching was senseless. Some have even suggested that the word translated empty talkers could be translated windbags. These are senseless babblers who know nothing uh, of spiritual good. And so what? They should be rejected in their entirety. There's no redeeming qualities to what they teach whatsoever. Well, again, uh, Paul said to Pastor Timothy in Ephesus, The aim of our charge is love that issues from a pure heart and a good conscience and a sincere faith. Certain persons, by swerving from these, have wandered away into vain discussion. That's the same idea. Desiring to be teachers of the law without understanding either what they're saying or the things about which they make confident assertions. You know what? Uh, what, they, uh, what they show in their ignorance, they make up for with their arrogance. Uh, they make confident assertions about the things that they don't know. And so they're arrogant and they're ignorant. Their teaching has no redeeming qualities, no beneficial content, no ability to build up others. It's just empty talk. They're just blowing air. But you say, well, isn't that an overstatement? I mean, you can turn on TBN, and at any given time, you might listen to a few minutes, and uh, what you hear is good. I mean, it's right on. It's biblical. And uh, you say, well, there's some truth there. Now, if you waited around long enough and you were discerning it all, uh, eventually you'd come across the air. But you say, but isn't there something that could be benefited from there? Uh, I mean, do we have to reject them uh, in their entirety? Yeah. Paul is so bold as to say that their teaching is meaningless. Why? Well, because truth mixed with error is no longer truth. Uh, we don't embrace teachers who mostly hold firm to the trustworthy word or hold firm to most of the trustworthy word. That's not what we do. And, uh, you know, trying to discern where the truth is and where the error is and pick out the truth and uh, throw out the rest. That's not what we do. No, instead we avoid them entirely. Uh, they're good for nothing. Uh, look in verse 16. It says there in Titus chapter 1, verse 16, They profess to know God, but they deny him by their works. They are detestable, disobedient, unfit for any good work. They're good for nothing. 
Avoid false teachers. Uh, don't listen to false teachers and say, well, I know they're off in this area and they're off in that area, but you know what? I really enjoy, uh, you know, they make me feel good. They build me up. Uh, they encourage me. Uh, but that feel good, uh, they're good for nothing. They're empty talkers. Uh, they're useless. They're senseless. Their teaching is meaningless. And frankly, they're dangerous as we're going to see. And so we avoid them in their entirety. And that's a warning for us. Don't tolerate someone who teaches what is mostly right. You're inevitably going to eventually swallow some error with truth. Further, there's no need to do, do this in our present day because we have an endless supply, it seems, of faithful teachers, thankfully. Uh, we're thankful to God for that, that he's provided such for the church in this day and age. But with uh, your online access and so on, you can have podcasts and apps and websites and whatever you want. Access to wonderful Bible teachers who are solid, who teach the trustworthy word and hold firm to it. There's no need to avail yourself to false teachers uh, who sometimes teach truth but mix it with error. Uh, they are useless. And so Paul continues, these are rebellious, they're useless, and next of all, they're liars. They're liars. False teachers are liars. Look in verse 10. It says there, for there are many who are insubordinate, empty talkers, and deceivers, and deceivers. As a consequence of their ungodly mixture of truth and error, they deceive some. And you know what? Their, deceptive, their, their, their deception is effective because it is mixed with truth. You know, if you ever have a Jehovah's Witness or a Mormon knock on your door, uh, you know, they are drawn to those who are believers. Uh, it, it, it's not so much going to those who have no concept of Christianity, but I think their favorite prey are those who would profess Christianity. Why? Because they use biblical vocabulary. They, they use some truth. The truth is the hook by which they catch the believers, and then they flay them with error. Uh, you ever have a Jehovah's Witness or a Mormon knock on your door? And, and hear that they're talking about salvation, they're talking about Jesus, they're talking about repentance. Mormons like to talk about baptism. But you know what? They're using different definitions for those words. Biblical words, uh, but erroneous definitions. And if you push them, uh, you'll see that if you have any discernment at all. But what are they doing? They're hijacking the truth. They're hijacking the truth, but then they mix it with error. Well, what happens when, you know, if you're wise in one of these knocks on your door, you tell them you're not interested and you shut the door. Now, if you're bold and you're equipped, then maybe you could confront them and maybe even evangelize them. But what happens when a genuine believer, weak in the faith, allows a false teacher like a Jehovah's Witness or a Mormon to come in and welcomes them to share their message? Well, as I said, these are trained to use scriptural language and they do hijack the truth. And what's going to happen is they're going to end up deceiving these. And so a weak believer is going to be led astray by these deceivers. 2 Timothy 3.6 Paul says, For among them are those who creep into households and capture weak women, burdened with sins and led astray by various passions, always learning and never able to arrive at a knowledge of the truth. And what he's saying there is that there are some who, you know, they're overcome with their sin, they're unstable, uh, they're burdened, they have a guilty conscience and so on, and it's, so it's easy prey. And also weak believers are easy prey. And you think about a lion. The Bible says that the, that the devil, like a roaring lion goes about seeking whom he may devour. And who does a lion devour? Well, those who are weak and those who are separated from the herd. And uh, false teachers love to go house to house. Why? Well, because that's where you're separate from the church. That's where you're apart from your elders. And uh, loves love to find those who are weak, who don't know a whole lot about scripture. Then they use scriptural language to deceive and to lead them astray. And throw, so through deception, they ensnare people in their false system. Have you ever seen this happen? Well, maybe somebody who's been following Christ for a while, but they're young in the faith, and all of a sudden you hear that uh, maybe they've having Jehovah's Witnesses over the house. They've been led astray by false teachers. This can be devastating to a household. Imagine a dad who starts out trying to follow, uh, lead his family to follow Christ, and all of a sudden he's led astray by false teachers. Or moms led astray by false teachers, or the kids are led astray by false teachers. You know how devastating that would be to a household? Well, look what Paul says in verse 11 of Titus chapter 1. He says of the false teachers, they must be silent since they are upsetting whole families by teaching for shameful gain what they ought not to teach. That is, this is devastating. They're having an effect. They're going host to house. You know, remember, these churches are not uh, organized yet. And so they're, they're scattered. And so the, the false teachers are able to go visit them in their homes, have home Bible studies with them and lead them astray. And they're upsetting whole households. And so they were susceptible, these believers were, uh, to the false teaching. And that's why the sense of urgency here from Paul to Titus. Whole households are being upended. 
Mom is led astray by false teaching. Dad is led astray by false teaching. Maybe the kids are led astray by false teaching. Uh, needless to say, these false teachers are wreaking havoc and they need to be stopped. Now, not only are they rebellious and useless and liars, but false teachers are also money hungry. They're money hungry. Look again at verse 11. What does it say? They must be silent since they are upsetting whole families by teaching for what? Shameful gain. Uh, what they ought not to teach. Not only are they going to deceive you into believing their useless babbling, but they're going to charge you for the privilege. Well, that's our experience with false teachers, isn't it? I mean, what false teachers are we talking about? I mean, uh, turn on TBN or some other channel. I don't know, is TBN even around? I, I don't know. I never watch these things. But uh, turn on some uh, Christian television station that has teachers. And what, you got Benny Hinn, you got Kenneth Copeland, you got Pat Robertson, you got Joel Osteen, you got T.D. Jakes. Uh, you know, people whose who's teaching is not biblical, uh, who have serious error. And why do they do this, though? I mean, why deceive others? Why go through this trouble of presenting yourself as a spiritual teacher, a spiritual leader, and, uh, and teach others? Why? Well, for money. For money. Is it any surprise that those who have this aberrant theology are also those who are very rich? Uh, why are they doing this? Well, they're gifted, frankly. They have some natural ability to communicate to others and to garner a following. But they're not spiritual, they're not gifted by God, and uh, they're not teaching uh, truth. They're false teachers, and they're teaching falsehood for money. Um, notice there, it says in verse uh, verse 11, that they're doing this for shameful gain, shameful gain, inappropriate, indecent, improper. That's what that means. It's indecent for a teacher of the Word of God to have a private jet. It's indecent for a teacher of the Word of God to have a multi-million dollar mansion. It's indecent for a preacher of the Word of God uh, to be wearing a $5,000 suit uh, and to be driving a Rolls Royce. Uh, that's indecent. Uh, that's improper. That's inappropriate. That's shameful. And so uh, Paul says they're teaching falsehood for shameful gain. Well, 2 Peter chapter 2 and verse 1. Let me get that on the screen here for you. 2 Peter 2, 1 through 3. It says, but false prophets also arose among the people, just as there will be false teachers among you who will secretly bring in destructive heresies, even denying the master who bought them, bringing upon themselves swift destruction, and many will follow their sensuality, and because of them the way of truth will be blasphemed, and in their greed they will exploit you with false words. Their condemnation from long ago is not idle, and their destruction is not asleep. That is, these false teachers are facing sure condemnation from God himself. They want to exploit you with false words. Why? Well, because they're greedy. They're greedy, and they want your money. Well, these false teachers not only are rebellious and useless and deceptive and money-hungry, but it gets even worse. They're also worldly hypocrites. They're worldly hypocrites. Look in verse 12. It says, One of the Cretans, a prophet of their own, said, Cretans are always liars, evil beasts lazy gluttons. A very interesting verse. What's happening here? Well, uh, to punctuate his point about the ungodly character of these false teachers, Paul is quoting a well-known proverb about Cretans. Here he quotes Epimenides, a Cretan prophet from the 6th century BC, uh, who testifies this about his own countrymen. They are liars, evil beasts, lazy gluttons. That is like animals. They are only concerned with their basest instincts. Like unreasonable animals, they live lazy, gluttonous, self-indulgent lives. And as to the relationship with others, they're liars. They're liars. They're always liars, it says. Uh, well, they could bear the description that Paul gives uh, to others elsewhere. In Philippians chapter 3 and verse 19, he said this, Their end is destruction. Their God is their belly. And they glory in their shame with mindset on earthly things. Uh, that's pretty damning. Well, the Greek historian Polybius said this. He says, So much, in fact, do sordid love of gain and lust for wealth prevail among the Cretans that the Cretans are the only people in the world in whose eyes no gain is disgraceful. Uh, that's the nature of, uh, well, really what had become known as the culture on the island of Crete. In fact, the word uh, Cretizo uh, means to play the Cretan or to speak like a Cretan, and that became synonymous with the idea of to lie, to lie. And so to be like a Cretan is to be a liar. The Cretans were famous for housing robbers and pirates. Cicero said that they consider piracy and robbery as honorable. That's the nature of the culture on the island of Crete. 
What does this tell us about the false teachers here that were troubling the believers in Crete? Uh, well, they were native Cretans. They didn't just come from some, somewhere else. Uh, these were false teachers from among the Cretans, so they were part of the Cretan culture. Also, they were Jewish, as we're going to see. Uh, but they uh, were not only Jewish, but they, through and through, they were also Cretans. Uh, what Paul is saying here is that these men were a direct product of the polluted culture of Crete. There was no transformation, no regeneration, not even reformation. These false teachers were exactly like the culture. And that's why I said they're worldly. They were exactly like the culture. Now, think about what Paul said to the Corinthians. You know, I said that there was a word that was used to describe Cretans, uh, Cretizo, and you would say, uh, well, you're, you're just a, like a Cretan. You're a liar. Uh, well, remember we've said something similar about the Corinthians. Uh, the culture in, in Corinth was so sexually immoral that to be sexually immoral or sexually deviant had become, uh, the word that was coined for that was to Corinthianize. Uh, to sleep with a prostitute was to Corinthianize. Uh, but let me show you something about Corinth and what Paul could say about the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians 6, 9. He could say, Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. But look what he says in verse 11. Sorry, catch up there. Verse 11, he says, And such were some of you. But you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. You see, he could make those statements about these Corinthians because they had been saved. They had been changed on the inside by the Holy Spirit of God because they put their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. They repented and turned from their old lifestyle, given their lives to Christ as Lord, and he changed them from the inside. They had been made new, regenerated, washed, sanctified. He couldn't say that about these teachers on the island of Crete. They were just like their culture. It was not, and such were some of you. You're still just like the Cretan culture. Evil beasts, liars, lazy gluttons. Uh, well... This is uh, kind of explains to us why Paul could say in verse 16 of Titus 1 that they profess to know God, but they deny him by their works. They are detestable, disobedient, unfit for any good work. These men are utter hypocrites whose mouths say one thing, but their works say another. In fact, that also was a hallmark of their character and teaching. They felt that one could separate belief from practice. It didn't matter what their works were. They felt that faith didn't have to affect works, and they were utterly wrong. In fact, the book of Titus, the letter that Paul wrote to Titus, is uh, significant and interesting because Paul does put such a heavy emphasis on works. And we've seen that in the past, and we're going to see it going in the future. But he does put a heavy emphasis on the fact that the Christian life uh, is one that uh, should show an evidence of uh, good works. In fact, he would tell us later on that God has redeemed us in order to purify for himself a people that are zealous of good works. Well, these false teachers on the island of Crete didn't believe that. Uh, their lifestyle didn't match up with their profession. They claimed to know God, but there's no evidence of that in their lives. Now, the assumption evident in this verse here, they profess to know God, but they deny him by their works. The assumption inherent there is that inter internal knowledge of God should be affirmed by our lifestyle. Uh, that wasn't true with them. Their lifestyle denied their profession. Instead, for us, our lifestyle should affirm our profession. So far from living in a way which reflects a knowledge of God, these men were detestable. It says there. That means an abomination, as we're going to see in a bit. Disobedient, unfit for any good work. And so these false teachers and false teachers today, they may have a big gleaming smile. They may seem very friendly. But they're teaching falsehood. And because they're teaching falsehood, what does that reveal about them? They're rebellious. They're useless. They're deceptive. They're money-hungry. And they're worldly hypocrites. That's the character of the teachers. Well, uh, we're going to move on from the character of the teachers. I mean, that's about, that's about enough, right? I mean, I think we, we, we beat them down and, and kicked them a few times while they were down. Uh, rebellious, useless, deceptive, money-hungry, worldly hypocrites. Well, now let's look at the content. The content of their teaching. Look in verse 10 of Titus 1. It says there, For there are many who are insubordinate, empty talkers, and deceivers, especially those of the circumcision party. And now we identify who they are that have this ungodly character. 
we know that there was a large population of Jews on the island of Crete. And what we learn here is that among these uh, Jews, there were some converts to Christianity or some apparent con uh, converts. Um, some would believe that these, uh, these false teachers were genuine believers who needed to be rebuked because later on it says they must be uh, rebuked sharply so that they can be sound in the faith. Uh, but I don't know. Uh, judging by the fact that their lifestyle does not uh, reflect their profession and the fact that they're called detestable, that word means abomination, uh, I don't know that we could say that these false teachers were just deceived or, or misguided uh, genuine believers. Um, I, that, that may be a stretch, but uh, you, may, you may think differently. That's okay. Uh, well, so these are some who were professing believers, um, Jews, on the island of Crete. But what? They were continuing to hold to Jewish tradition. And that's why Paul says there that they were of the circumcision party. That is, uh, they are those who believe that circumcision was necessary. It doesn't matter whether or not you're a Jew or a Gentile. If you are to be saved and you place your faith in Christ, you also must be circumcised. And with that, they also added other uh, requirements that were extra biblical. And so this is a sect of Christianity, and it's been present from very early on. In Acts chapter 10, when Peter goes and salvation is open to the Gentiles, remember uh, Cornelius the centurion, when he comes back to the church, um, he's accused by who? People of the circumcision party. Well, you went and you ate with Gentiles uh, who are unclean and so on. Uh, it was for fear of the people from the circumcision party that remember Peter and Paul, there was a conflict there in Antioch where Peter was behaving one way when the circumcision party was not there, but when the people from the circumcision party showed up, then Peter all of a sudden would stop eating and sitting with the Gentiles. Uh, and Paul rebuked him for that. Uh, the circumcision party, this sect of Christianity, these Jewish converts who were still holding on to the law and demanding circumcision and other things be imposed upon uh, converts to Christianity, uh, they've been causing trouble for quite a while. And uh, here they are again infecting the churches in Crete. And so they added to the message of salvation. Uh, added to the message of salvation by grace through faith alone by insisting uh, on circumcision and other Jewish rules and rites and regulations for salvation. And so the first thing we learn about their teaching is what? Well, they were guilty of the misapplication of the law. They were guilty of the misapplication of the law. They did not accept the fact that the shadows of the Old Testament law had been fulfilled in Christ. They did not accept that salvation by grace through faith in Christ alone uh, was the way of salvation, and uh, it was not by keeping the law. You can tell by Paul's description of them that a heavy, heavy emphasis uh, uh, from them, again, was placed upon circumcision. Such teachings were a continual thorn in the side of Paul's flesh throughout his ministry, and so he wrote repeatedly against these who would teach that you must be circumcised, or you must keep the law, or you must observe days, Sabbaths, and so on in order to be saved. And uh, one key passage where Paul did that writing is in Galatians 5. Galatians 5, verse 1. It says, For freedom Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. Look, I, Paul, say to you that if you accept circumcision, Christ will be of no advantage to you. I testify again to every man who accepts circumcision that he is obligated to keep the whole law. You are severed from Christ. Uh, who you would be, you are severed from Christ, you who would be justified by the law. You have fallen away from grace. For through the Spirit, by faith, we ourselves eagerly wait for the hope of righteousness. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision counts for anything, but only faith working through love. You were running well. Who hindered you from obeying the truth? This persuasion is not from him who calls you, a little leaven leavens the whole lump. I have confidence in the Lord that you will take no other view than mine, and the one who is troubling you will bear the penalty, whoever he is. But if I, brothers, shall still preach circumcision, why am I still being persecuted? In that case, the offense of the cross has been removed. I wish those who unsettle you would emasculate themselves. For you who are called to freedom, brothers, only do not, uh, for you are called to freedom, brothers, only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. What is Paul saying? He's saying salvation is by grace through faith in Christ alone, with no admixture of works. He's saying by adding works to salvation, those of the circumcision party were destroying the gospel message. The gospel is the good news of salvation by grace through faith alone. 
To add any amount of human works to that is to destroy the gospel entirely. In fact, look at this strong language that Paul uses in Galatians chapter 1. He says, I am astonished that you are so quickly deserting him who called you in the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel. Not that there is another one, but there are some who trouble you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to the one we preached to you, let him be accursed. As we have said before, so now I say again, if anyone is preaching to you a gospel contrary to the one you received, let him be accursed. That is, if you're going to preach circumcision or going to preach the law, uh, you're adding to the gospel, and frankly, you're cursed to introduce any element of law into salvation. Um, is what? Well, that's uh, inventing a new gospel. That is not a, a gospel. Uh, understand that if you introduce any bit of the law, you then are obligated to keep the whole law. If you're going to go law, you got to go law. But you can't lo- add law to gospel. Either it's the law or it's grace. If it's the law, then it's the whole law. And you're going to be guilty and condemned as a lawbreaker because that's just human nature. If it is by faith, then you're saved by the grace of God as he applies the righteousness of Christ to you and uh, applies his merit to you. Uh, It's either you, by your own works, seeking to keep the law, uh, or it's you recognizing that you cannot, only Christ can, and placing your faith in him. Any gospel which presents human works or law keeping as an element necessary for salvation is heresy. It's a false gospel, and according to Paul in Galatians 1, it is to be condemned. Let that one be accursed. And so these teachers, by teaching circumcision and other elements of the law and man-made religion, are guilty of misapplying the law. Next of all, they're not only guilty of misapplying the law, they're also guilty of mythologizing the truth. Mythologizing the truth. Look in verse 13. It says in Titus 1, 13 through 14, this testimony is true. Why? Well, that the Cretans are evil beasts, lazy gluttons, and uh, always liars. This testimony is true. Therefore rebuke them sharply that they may be sound in the faith, not devoting themselves to Jewish myths and the commands of people who turn away from the truth. And so there it is. Uh, They are devoting themselves to Jewish myths. It was the practice of some Jewish teachers to create long genealogies of Old Testament characters. And then what they would do is they would attach fanciful stories and backgrounds uh, to those characters. And so mythological. And so they would take some Old Testament hero, some Old Testament character, come up with some story to attach to them. Or, or genealogies and have characters in those genealogies that they would attach stories to. And then what they would do is uh, they would glean some principles or some teaching or some rules or whatever it may be from those stories and that they would teach then based upon those extra biblical stories, much like Catholics do with the Apocrypha. Uh, And so in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 3 through 4, Paul says to Timothy, As I urged you when I was going to Macedonia, remain at Ephesus so that you may charge certain persons not to teach any different doctrine, nor to devote themselves to myths and endless genealogies which promote speculations rather than the stewardship from God that is by faith. Now notice there in verse 4, it says that these things promote speculations rather than the stewardship from God that is by faith. Because their teaching was not rooted firmly in the trustworthy word as had been taught, and instead rested upon obscure stories and invented histories, they spent much time in speculation. That is, instead of teaching and obeying what is clearly revealed in Scripture, they spent their time endlessly speculating about the truth. And, you know, that's what people do. Uh, Always learning and never able to come to a knowledge of the truth. Let's just pontificate about truth as if you can never really arrive at what the truth actually is. And so you just nibble around the edges and just sit and speculate and speculate and speculate. And you can do that when you're continually adding mythology uh, to your belief system. And so you could, do, you could picture that. People just sitting around recounting or inventing myths and then speculating about the implications and applications. It's their truth, quote unquote. Uh, you hear people say that today. This is my truth. Uh, this is my truth. Uh, it's not your truth. It's your delusion. It's your delusional bubble. Uh, that's your truth. Uh, and then you demand that others don't pop your bubble. Well, reality wants to pop your bubble. Uh, it's not your truth. Uh, there is uh, one truth. And... Uh, fact of the matter is Jesus Christ himself said that he is the way, the truth, and the life, and no one can come to the Father through him. That's truth. So their truth is nonsense to begin with. Their pontifications are even worse. Now, sadly, 
I remember some time ago, uh, somebody visited our church and they came on a Wednesday night because they heard it was a Bible study. And uh, if you've been to a Bible study on Wednesday night, you know that it's uh, generally me teaching the Word of God. Uh, it's a little bit more casual, and so we can open it up to questions and feedback and so on. But it's still teaching the Word of God. And this person uh, left our Bible study, and later on he told me that he was disappointed because his understanding of Bible study was that uh, we were basically going to look at the text and have an opportunity for everybody to go around and for, for them to share what they thought the text meant. Uh, well, there's a problem with that. There may be a time for something like that. Uh, but in many Bible studies, um, this is what we find. The Word of God is seen as an open book, which is open to any interpretation. A group of individuals without any discipline to learn or to read or interpret the Scriptures or even how to apply the Scriptures, they just sit around ignorantly talking about what they think any given passage may mean. Well, to me, it means this. Well, to me, it means this. They do so with no concept of hermeneutics uh, or reading the text in context, no discipline to understand the audience or the backgrounds or how the text fits into a larger context or the balance of Scripture. Instead of seeing the Word of God as a cohesive whole, which has a logical flow, which follows the story of redemption, they see it as a random mishmash of texts which are open to personal interpretation and speculation. Well, that's not Bible study. I mean, that's just pooling your ignorance is what that is. That's not Bible study. Uh, well, uh, those in this passage, they're guilty of using their myths to promote speculation instead of just giving themselves to the trustworthy word as taught and finding concrete authoritative truth by which they were to order their lives. And so nothing good comes from this. As the text says, such people are just senseless windbags. Their so-called Bible study is an effort in futility. And so now notice next, that these teachers not only were guilty of misapplying the law and mythologizing the truth, but next of all, they were guilty of manufacturing commands. Manufacturing commands. Look in verse 13 again. Paul says in verse 14 that they're devoting themselves to Jewish myths and the commands of people. The commands of people. These teachers compounded their error by adding to their misuse of the law and their myth-driven speculations man-made commandments. Man-made commandments. That is, the practices of the Pharisees, which Jesus so often rebuked, they were alive and well in the circumcision party. They added to the law by demanding compliance to man-made rules. They imposed asceticism upon others. That is, the strict adherence to extra-biblical commands to abstain from substances or practices which the scriptures did not forbid. These are man-made regulations. They would elevate these man-made rules and commands even to the level of scripture. And so Jesus said in Matthew 15, verse 8, This people honors me with their lips. He's quoting Isaiah 29, 13. This people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. In vain they do worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. And we know that these teachers from the circumcision party were guilty of teaching asceticism, uh, man-made doctrines as the commandments of men, because of what we see in Titus chapter 1 and verse 15. Look at it in your text. Paul says, To the pure all things are pure, but to the defiled and unbelieving nothing is pure, but both their minds and their consciences are defiled. Well, if you don't understand what's going on here, this seems kind of like a random verse uh, stuck here. But Paul says, to the pure, all things are pure, but to the defiled, unbelieving, nothing is pure. But their minds and their consciences are defiled. What is he talking about? He is addressing asceticism. This idea that if I just give myself to abide by external rules and regulations or rights, or whatever it may be, I then can become pure internally. If I just do it right, if I just light, right, light the right candle, pray the right way, pray the right amount of times, pray in the right direction, whatever it may be, if I just give myself to these things externally, avoid this type of meat, avoid this kind of food, eat this kind of food, whatever it may be, if I just do that, then I can become righteous or pure on the inside. Uh, that's not how it works. Uh, you don't become changed from, on the inside through anything external, uh, as we're going to see. But these were guilty of that. And so Paul is addressing that in verse 15 about purity and how we come to purity. Uh, what he's going to show us is that no amount of rigid self-discipline can destroy fleshly passions. That has to be done by the Spirit of God. Mankind needs to be changed from the inside out, not from the outside in. Well, Paul addresses this at length in the book of Colossians. And so you might want to turn there, Colossians chapter 2 and Colossians chapter 3. We're going to read it. We're running out of time, so we don't have time to say make a whole lot of comments, but I'm going to read it to you. 
Colossians chapter 2, verse 16. Paul says, Therefore let no one pass judgment on you in questions of food and drink, or with regard to a festival or a new moon or Sabbath. Why? Well, because those things, uh, to the extent that they were biblical, have been done away with because the shadow that those things uh, represented has now been fulfilled in Christ. These are a shadow of the things to come, but the substance belongs to Christ. Let no one disqualify you, insisting on asceticism and worship of angels, going on in detail about visions, puffed up without reason by his sensuous mind, and not holding fast to the head from whom the whole body, nourished and knit together through its joints and ligaments, grows with a growth that is from God. If with Christ you died to the elemental spirits of the world, why, as if you were still alive in the world, do you submit to regulations? Do not handle, do not taste, do not touch, uh, referring... Uh, to things that all perish as they are used, according to human precepts and teachings. These have indeed an appearance of wisdom in promoting self-made religion and asceticism and severity to the body, but they have no value in stopping the indulgence of the, fa uh, the flesh. Paul says to the Colossians, this self-made religion and asceticism may appear wise, but it actually has no power to change one spiritually. It has no power to produce genuine righteousness. What then is the answer? If those things do not pr produce righteousness, what then is the answer? Well, uh, continue on Colossians chapter 3, verse 5. I'm sorry. Colossians chapter 3 uh, and verse 5. If then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above, where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things that are above and not on things that are on the earth. For you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ who is your life appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. He's saying, don't put your attention and effort into self-made religion and asceticism in order to achieve righteousness. Instead, what? Look to Jesus. He's saying, set your mind on the things that are above. Why? Well, because you've already died. If you're a believer, you've already died to yourself. Uh, and what? Now you're alive in Christ. Saying, look to Christ and trust in his righteousness alone and the fact that God has applied his righteousness to you, uh, you who are in Christ. And so, what? Get your mind off of I'm going to beat my body. I'm going to I'm going to go on a special diet. I'm going to abstain from this food. I'm going to keep this rig, these rigid rules and rituals and regulations. And again, uh, you think about, uh, you know, I'm going to pray this many times. I'm going to pray this certain prayer over and over again. I'm going to light a candle. I'm going to make sure I face in a certain direction. I'm going to fast at the right times, whatever it may be, thinking that these externals somehow are going to cleanse me internally. It doesn't work that way. It's, it's complete opposite of the truth. And so Paul says, no, remember Christ. Set your mind on things above, on Christ. Why? Because that's where your life is. That's where your righteousness is. If you're a genuine believer, you're already counted as righteous by virtue of the righteousness of Christ. It's never going to happen by your own works. Now, if you are a, an, an astute listener, you're going to remember that last week uh, I said that we teach the trustworthy word as taught. And we do that... Uh, in part, not because we're trying to produce theological eggheads, I said. And I said, not because we're trying to produce deeper life mystics, uh, you know, these who say, just think about grace, just think about grace, and everything's going to be okay. Uh, and, and again, we're not teaching the trustworthy word simply to fill our heads with knowledge. Um, but what? Uh, we are to teach the trustworthy word, and then we are to go on to godly lifestyle. And we saw that last time, and we're going to see it later on uh, in the coming weeks as the book of Titus just leads right into godly lifestyle. And so we said we teach theology, and then we teach the therefores, the applications and the implications of theology. Remember that last time? And so I said uh, that we don't just teach uh, so that we become deeper life mystics, uh, kind of those who are just thinking about doctrine and thinking about theology, but we have to go on to implication and application and live a godly lifestyle. But not for salvation, we said, from salvation. Well, uh, here in Colossians chapter 3, doesn't it kind of look like Paul is saying the opposite? I mean, chapter 3, verse uh, uh, 1 through, or Colossians chapter 2, he's talking about asceticism and how uh, that's not going to lead to righteousness and so on. And then in chapter 3, verse 1 through 4, he says what? Just set your minds on Christ. Set your minds on Christ. Um, set your mind on the things that are above, where Christ is. He's at the right hand of God. So just think about Christ. Is that what he's saying? Uh, give, you know, no asceticism, not the rigid adherence to the rules. Just think about Christ. 
Well, look what happens after he says this. Not asceticism. Don't not keeping the rules and the rituals and the rites and not that. That's not how you achieve righteousness. But set your mind on Christ. Well, is that it? Well, look what he does right after he says that we are to set our minds on Christ in Colossians chapter three, verse five. He says, then, uh, put to death. Therefore, what is earthly in you, sexual immorality, impurity, passions, evil desires, covetousness, which is idolatry. On account of these, the wrath of God is coming. And these you too once walked when you were living in them, but now you must put them all away. Anger, wrath, malice, slander, and obscene talk from your mouth. Do not lie to one another, seeing that you have put off the old self with its practices and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge after the image of its creator. Uh, here there is not Greek or and Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave, free, but Christ is all and in all. Put on, then, as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience, bearing with one another. And if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other, as the Lord has forgiven you, so you must also forgive. And above all these things, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body. And be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts. And whatever you do, in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. That is quite the list. Not asceticism. Not the rigid adherence to rules. Not the rights and the regulations and thinking that we're going to achieve internal righteousness through that type of physical discipline uh, to achieve righteousness. Not that, but remember, set your mind upon Christ. Why? Well, because you're dead and you're alive in him. Why does that matter? Well, because if you're in Christ, what? God then counts Christ's righteousness as if it is yours. Now, how did that happen? Because you have exercised faith. Faith, not works. But now, because you're in Christ and because that righteousness has been applied to you, what then? Do we just give off works? Uh, forget about works. Works have nothing to do with this. Uh, well, they have nothing to do with attaining the righteousness, but it does have something to do with living out that righteousness. And so then immediately, Paul says, after putting our minds upon Christ, what? Uh, put off these old practices and put on these new practices, right? Uh, that's what he's saying. And whatever you do in word or deed, do all uh, to the glory of God. Uh, and so works flow from righteousness. Righteousness is not the product of works. Uh, and so this is the fatal flaw of asceticism. It seeks to attain internal righteousness through external rigidity, and that's an impossibility. Uh, and again, that doesn't mean that the Christian life doesn't involve self-discipline. Paul, Paul himself said that he beats his body and brings it under subjection. Why? Uh, because after preaching to others, he didn't want to become a castaway or disqualified. And so the Christian life does feature self-discipline and self-control and abstinence at times and delayed gratification, uh, abstinence from some substances and practices and so on. But again, these things do not attain righteousness. They flow from righteousness. And so if you're watching this video and you come from a religious tradition, or maybe you are currently part of a religious tradition that emphasizes externals, do this and don't do that and pray this way and pray this many times and don't eat this and make sure you eat that and give this much money and light this many candles and so on. Understand that these externals have absolutely no power to change you on the inside. What you need is to trust Jesus Christ alone for righteousness. Place your faith in him as the only Savior and as the only Lord. And God, by his grace, will, in response to the faith that he's given you, count Christ's righteousness as if it is yours. Not because you were earned it, because you didn't. It's by faith. But he will count Christ's righteousness as if it is yours. Uh, he'll give you his Holy Spirit. And he will change you from the, not the outside in, but from the inside out. Well, look again at our passage in verse 15. Paul says, To the pure, all things are pure. But to the defiled and unbelieving, nothing is pure but both their minds and their consciences are defiled. And with that, he's dismantling the idea of asceticism. The false teaching of the men who are troubling the believers in Crete. He's, dis he's dismantling it. Uh, for those who are internally pure via genuine salvation, Paul is saying, they need not concern themselves with being defiled by eating the wrong foods, failing to practice uh, the, the, the rites or not observing days. He's saying these things don't defile them. They're already pure on the inside. On the other hand, for those who are defiled and unbelieving, they are defiled on the inside. 
and uh, their minds and consciences are already polluted. No amount of externals can change that. Jesus said in Matthew 7, verse 15, There is nothing outside a person that by going into him can defile him, but the things that come out of a person are what defile him. It's all about the internal, the mind, the conscience, the soul, the spirit. Paul would warn Pastor Timothy about teachers who would seek to teach others these types of errors in 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1. Now, the Spirit expressly says that in later times some will depart from the faith by devoting themselves to deceitful spirits and the teachings of demons, through the insincerity of liars whose consciences are seared, who forbid marriage and require abstinence from foods that God created to be received with thanksgiving by those who believe and know the truth. For everything created by God is good, and nothing is to be rejected if it's received with thanksgiving. Uh, he's saying for those uh, who have been what? Those who have been transformed. Uh, you know, those who uh, have been created, uh, recreated by God on the inside. He's saying, for these, you can eat what you want to eat. Eat what you want to eat. You don't have to observe festivals. You don't have to observe days. Uh, you don't have to observe the rites and the regulations. You're pure on the inside. All these things have been purified for you. On the other hand, if you're an unbeliever, if you're defiled and your conscience is, uh, is defiled, well, none of these things are pure to you. You bring your impurity to it. Uh, you don't become pure by them. And so, we have men who are teaching that one can become pure by outward rules and ritual. Uh, Paul adds insult to injury here by not only proving that their teaching could never lead to righteousness, but look in verse 16. We're almost done here. It says, They profess to know God, but they deny Him by their works. They are detestable, disobedient, unfit for any good work. But notice that word there. It says they are detestable. Not only were these teachers not pure, but the word detestable there can also be translated abomination. In their efforts to make themselves ritually clean through personal works, they had rendered themselves unacceptable to God. By not accepting salvation by grace through faith alone, they actually became an abomination. They're ritually unclean. Uh, so in their attempts to become pure, they actually became impure. Their attempts to become ritually clean, they became ritually unclean. They were not acceptable to God. They were an abomination. And so... These rebellious, vain, deceptive, money-hungry, worldly hypocrites are guilty of misapplying the law, mythologizing the truth, and manufacturing commands. Uh, that was the content of their teaching. And as a consequence of their teaching, what? Well, they are upsetting whole households. They are upsetting whole households. So now what? So now what? What's the response to these? Well, this is not behavior that can go unaddressed. And so Paul as an apostle and Titus as an elder, they have a stewardship from God. They need to protect the church. They need to care for the flock. And so look what Paul says in verse 11. He says that the testimony from Epimenides about the Cretans was true. Therefore, rebuke them sharply that they may be sound in the faith. First of all, they must be silenced. Mus muzzled, that means, or shut up. Next, they need to be rebuked sharply. Uh, that's abruptly, curtly. Shut them down. How? How do they do that? Angrily scolding them or just telling them to cut it out by humiliation and name calling? No. Remember our context? That the qualified elder must hold firm to the trustworthy word as taught. Why? So that he may be able to give instruction in sound doctrine uh, and uh, be able to rebuke those who contradict it. Why? For there are many who are insubordinate, empty talkers, uh, deceivers, especially those of the circumcision party. Uh, you need to be equipped with the word and be able to teach it and rebuke so that you can address uh, the false teachers. Titus was to appoint men into leadership positions who held firm to the word so that they could take on these men who were preying upon the believers on the island and silence them and sharply rebuke them. How? By confronting them with the truth. By confronting them with the truth. By handling the word of God. And so they were to confront them with the truth and bolster believers in their discernment. And so they had to be able to teach the word so that they could strengthen and make doctrinally stable the believers. And they were also to know the word so they could rebuke uh, the false teachers. And by, by dismantling the false teachers with the truth and by bolstering believers in the discernment, the elders would render the false teachers powerless and compound their defeat by removing a receptive audience uh, by educating the believers on the island. Well, in conclusion... I really tried to do this in under an hour. Uh, almost made it, not quite. But in conclusion, 
I'd like you to consider the character and the nature of these false teachers in contrast uh, to the qualified elder, as we had seen in the previous 16-part series uh, in verses 5 through 9. And so just a few bullet points and we're done. The false teachers were insubordinate, where the qualified elder is a man under authority. He's submissive to the instruction of the apostles and the trustworthy word has been taught. The false teacher teaches vain, worthless, and senseless things, while the qualified elder gives instruction in sound doctrine and he teaches the trustworthy word. The false teacher devotes himself to myths and legalism and asceticism, while the qualified elder teaches the word as delivered by Christ and the apostles. The false teacher is to be silenced, while the qualified elder is actually commanded to teach. You see that in chapter 2, verse 1. The false teacher teaches for money. Well, remember, the qualified elder is not greedy for gain. The Cretan false teachers are called evil beasts and lazy gluttons, while the qualified elder is not a drunkard, uh, but is self-controlled and disciplined. The false teacher is an abomination, while the qualified elder is holy. The false teacher is unfit for any good work, while the qualified elder is to be a model of good works. Chapter 2, verse 7. The false teacher is a liar who deceives others in his teaching, and the qualified elder shows integrity and dignity in his teaching. Chapter 2, verse 7 again. And the false teacher upsets whole families, while the qualified elder sets whole families in order. And you see that in chapter 2, verse 1 through 10, uh, with that sound doctrine given to husbands and wives and children and so on. And so there we have it. False teachers must be silenced. And because of the time, we're going to stop right there. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we thank you for your word and its clarity. We pray for any who are watching this who maybe have been uh, allowing themselves to watch or to glean from false teachers. We pray that you would show them that that's a dangerous game to be playing, and I pray that they'd reject them outright and that they would find uh, men who hold firm to the trustworthy word and give themselves entirely to that teaching, uh, understanding that the other are worthless. And for those who might come from a background of asceticism, rules, regulations, legalism, I pray that they'd understand that salvation is only found by grace through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and that they cannot achieve it by their own effort or their own righteousness. They need the righteousness of Christ applied to them by your grace uh, in answer to their faith in faith alone. I pray that you would help them to understand that. And now, Lord, we, again, we thank you for your word. Help us as a church uh, to uh, grow in loving unity and spiritual maturity and doctrinal stability uh, so that we can uh, handle false teachers the way that they ought to be handled uh, when we encounter them. Lord, we thank you for all of this in the name of Christ. Amen. Thank you, everybody.